Welcome to Global India, the cultural fusion podcast. We are in the business of building cross-cultural bridges and not walls. And folks, we are not asking Mexico to pay for our bridges either. Hello, I'm your host, Dr. Lily Padman. Welcome to another inspiring episode, Zeroing in on Zero. We have four distinguished guests adding sparkle to this episode. Dr. Unni Narayanan, Senior Director at Google, his wife Usha, a lawyer, and their children Sahana, an accomplished Indian classical musician, and Kalyan, an accomplished pianist. Sahana will sing a devotional song set in Shiva Ranjani Raga. Kalyan will play Western classical music on the piano. After the music session, I will briefly interview Sahana and Kalyan. Also, the parents, Unni and Usha, will get a chance to share with us the secret behind their successful parenting. Thank you.
Kalyan, for your brilliant performance. You are an academic high achiever and an accomplished pianist. Clearly, you're able to combine the academic and musical tracks seamlessly. Can you tell us a little bit about your academic background and your specific training in music? Yeah, um, so I'm a senior or going to be a senior at the Harker School in San Jose. Um, I've been there since fifth grade, and before then I was at the Living Wisdom School. Um, I've played classical piano for about 11 years with Dr. Liang Yun Yu. Um, I've played jazz piano for about three years. At school, I participate in the a cappella choir uh, as the president. Um, I play piano in the school's jazz band and jazz program, um, and I sing and manage the musical theater shows as like a music director. I also play a little bit of guitar, bass, and drums, um, but piano is my main musical interest. Outside of performing arts, I also enjoy studying chemistry and film studies, which I'll be doing a research project on over the next year. Wow, that is indeed brilliant. How did you get interested in music? Does it run in the family? Um, I think my parents were, yeah, I think it runs in the family to some extent. Um, both my parents are very into music, and from a young age, they were constantly um, immersing my sister and I um, in a wide variety of genres. So uh, we would listen to music like Stevie Wonder and uh, the Beatles, but also El Subramaniam and Glenn Gould and Yehudi Menuhin. So we were constantly um, being uh, filled with all these different types of um, influences and artists um, who all had different ways of approaching sound. Oh, that's really interesting. A, a true fusion of cultures. I can just see yeah. what was happening there. Who and what mm -hmm. are the sources of your inspiration? Uh, can you explain to us your creative process? Yeah, so I think uh, for me and my creative process in music, probably the two um, biggest uh, ways I express um, my creativity in the music is through the jazz um, and through the uh, interpretation in classical. Um, in jazz, it's a little more straightforward because of the actual uh, uh, you're actually creating melodic and rhythmic ideas on the fly, and um, so there you can. Um, integrate a lot of different inspirations. So I can um, play a uh, melody that I might have heard from a Stevie Wonder album um, or a scale that um, is reminiscent of a Carnatic scale. Um, so in, in jazz, jazz is a very natural extension of merging those different sources of inspiration. In classical, um, because so much of it is there's fixed notes and there's a fixed pattern, it's more in terms of the interpretation and expression. So in classical, um, how you play each note, that's where you have the opportunity to integrate these different influences. So, um, for example, in um, in the piece that you just heard, uh, the Bach Tempest, there uh, is a section in the uh, middle where there are four separate voices. And um, each voice, it's very easy to just, play those notes and give each note um, that's happening at the same time the same volume and the same uh, extent of loudness. But um, if you um, listen to how, how it's been written, um, you'll notice that there's actually one melody at the top that's much more important. So you actually have to play that slightly louder and, and um, more um, out so that... Um, it, it adds a different color to how it sounds. Well, thank you, Kalyan, for your deep insights into both Western and Indian classical music, as well as jazz. And thank you for joining us on this podcast. Thank you, Sahana, for your melodious rendering of Carnatic music. It's truly amazing that you have been able to pursue Carnatic music in Palo Alto, a far cry from Chennai, the epicenter of Carnatic music. Remarkably, you have excelled in your academic pursuit as well. Can you tell us a little bit about your academic background and your specific training in music? Of course. Just a little bit about myself. I'm a rising senior at Columbia University, and I'm majoring in comparative literature and society, and I'm doing a minor in jazz. 
at school, I sing in the jazz performance program. And I, as you mentioned, I've also learned Carnatic music or South Indian classical music for about 15 years from my guru, Srimati J. Sri Vardarajan, based in Sunnyvale, California. Um, and this summer, I'm working on my Arangetram, or debut concert, which will last about three hours. I've also learned Western classical music, uh, Western classical violin from Lee Lin for quite a few years. And I continue to take lessons from him in New York as he teaches at, at Juilliard. Um, in high school, I've participated in a variety of performing arts activities, from singing in the jazz band as the lead singer. And I also participated in the musical theater shows and the um, drama performances. And I also did a lot of various humanities extracurriculars and research projects. That's wonderful. Sahana, uh, how do you interact with and respond to your friends who don't have a clue about uh, Carnatic music? In fact, it would be really nice if you can give us a brief lowdown on Carnatic music. Yeah, of course. So, um, Carnatic music can be traced back to the Vedas, which are the ancient, ancient scriptures of Hinduism. And the purpose of, for singing this music was specifically for divine or spiritual upliftment um and of course carnatic music comes from the south of india so all the songs are composed in Telugu, tamil sanskrit malayalam um, and Kannada. and when i describe carnatic music to my friends i actually draw an analogy to jazz um which is kind of undergoing this renaissance revival right now in places like new york city and san francisco and we see also a lot of cross-cultural fusion music between carnatic uh, musicians and jazz musicians who happen to be Indian as well. Um, but basically in jazz, we see these long extended solos where the instrumentalist will elaborate in a particular mode or scale within the boundaries um, of a standard song, and then they'll return to the refrain. And this is actually very, very similar to Carnatic music, which is built from a detailed system of ragas, which are comparable to modes um, in Western music, and the performer will have to improvise on the spot. Um, and of course now it's not just, you know, whatever the performer wants to do in the spot because it takes years of practice, um, and knowledge and in-depth analysis of these ragas or these, um, starting scales in order to be able to improvise on the spot. Um, so this starts from day one when we learn different patterns of swaras or note positions that each raga can take. Um, and then we learn how to put them all together in, in this, uh, creative music, which is known as Manodharma. And basically, Mano Dharma can be uh, broken down into Alapana, Swarthalpana, and Naravo. And all of these are kind of various techniques and forms to undergo an in-depth exploration of each raga. So I would say improvisation is really the core of Carnatic music. Lovely. Have you ever dealt with performance anxiety? Yeah, definitely. Um, this past year has been very good experience with dealing with that because I joined a band at school and we had a lot of performances um, in local venues around New York City and I really had to deal with um, the stress that my body would kind of undergo during these performances because or right before these performances because I would get very nervous and my voice would dry up and my throat wouldn't be able to produce any sound which is of course not ideal for singing um, so I kind of had to learn how to deal with that and just be very present in each performance and understand each performance um, for what it truly is, which is an exchange and conversation, uh, which just happens to be in the language or medium of music uh, performance just between the performer and the audience and really I create a genuine moment uh, for both sides. Well, that's definitely good advice. And uh, maybe you can tell us uh, about your favorite performances and venues. Yeah. Um, Definitely in New York, it's been wonderful performing at some local venues, uh, just some like local cafes and smaller venues as well as some larger venues. I performed at Lincoln Center um, in New York City with my acapella group, which was um, a huge stage and definitely a, a really fun experience as well. Um, it's really wonderful to have kind of strangers come up in, who are from the real world you know, after the performance and they want to learn more about your music and, and everything. So that's been a really fun experience. Wow, that's fantastic, Sahana. Between busy schedules, practice sessions, and performances, it must have been challenging to find time for this interview. Thank you, Sahana, for taking the time. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Lilian. Before I interview my next guest, who is a tech guru, 
I would like to interject a short comedy interlude. I'm sure you've seen caricatures of the stereotypical Indian techie, including the bank robbery joke by the popular comedian Gabriel Iglesias. Iglesias shows how Indians cannot be bank robbers by imagining a scenario where two Indian guys decide to rob a bank. Here is a crisp, rip-roaring version of this joke. This is how it would be if two Indians decide to rob a bank. The first one goes inside and comes out a little while later with a laptop in his hand. The second one asks him, Hey, did you get any of the money? The first one replies, No, I did not get any money. The second one asks him, Did you show them the gun? The first one says, Yes, I showed them the gun. The second one says, Well, why do you have a laptop with you? The first one replies, because they thought I was tech support. So the second one says, Quick, let's run out of here before the cops get here. The first one says, ah, Don't bother, they're still busy laughing. What a hilarious outcome. It's nice to be able to inject humor into any situation. Dr. Uni and Usha Narayanan will join us now. Thank you, Uni and Usha, for joining us on this podcast. This is indeed one of those rare moments in my life that I could never have anticipated, even in my wildest dreams. A kid I knew when I was in Chicago many years ago has blossomed into this successful senior executive at Google. I'm so happy to have reconnected with Uni recently and to have met Usha at their lovely home in Palo Alto. I have immense pleasure in introducing Dr. Unni and Usha Narayanan to our listeners. So nice to speak with you again. It's wonderful that we were able to reconnect. Can you both tell us a little bit about your academic and professional backgrounds? First Unni and then Usha. Ah, hey, Lilianti. Thank you again for uh, inviting us to join you on your podcast. Uh, very briefly, uh, I, as you mentioned, uh, we live in Northern California. I work currently at Google. Uh, prior to working at Google, um, I worked in several large companies, IBM and Intel. Uh, then I was a tech founder, a startup guy for about 10 years. Uh, academically, I have a PhD in computer science from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. I started out my career working in sort of low power semiconductor and now I'm in consumer products uh, at Google, uh, working on the Google Assistant. Thanks, Lilianti. I've been working in the Silicon Valley as an attorney for the past 20 years. I started my career at a law firm here in Palo Alto, Wilson Sonsini. Then I went to Cisco and then I took some time off to spend with my children and I joined HP about eight years ago. I'm currently senior legal counsel, and my focus area is product counseling and tech transactions, which means I look at laws for new products and I negotiate agreements with partners. Uh, This past year, I had the chance to review all of the privacy policies for our new PCs, which was very interesting and very topical. In my spare time, I enjoy reading and I have a deep interest in literature. Yeah, I've always been fascinated by creativity. Something that comes from nothing becomes something. Creativity for the future is to figure out where that technology is useful and where it can be used to help people. Thanks so much. Thank you, Shell, for your fascinating insight into technology and life and tying up the two together. Um, now, I have uh, a question regarding your talented children. Having listened to your talented children speak and perform, I'm sure the listeners are wondering, what is the magic recipe for successful parenting? Perhaps you can give us some insight into your strategies that worked, Uni or Usha, either of you. Okay, um, maybe I'll go first. So, um, honestly, I... Uh, I, I don't believe we're necessarily exceptionally great parents or anything like that. I think that um, we've been very lucky uh, to uh, have the resources and a very rich uh, environment of Northern California, which is very intellectually stimulating for our whole family, for our kids, etc. So 
Uh, I think there have been a lot of sort of uh, environmental advantages uh, that we've had uh, that have, you know, enabled opportunities for our children. So I'd start off with that. Um, I think that one of the things that any parent learns uh, over time is that, you know, kids aren't empty vessels uh, who you can kind of imprint and direct and mold. Uh, they are own unique personalities and we as parents can only help them kind of uncover their own journey. Um, so I think that's the second dimension. Um, I think all of us have inborn talents, but, you know, I think results are ultimately forged by hard work. And, and to that extent, I think uh, we've tried to, all of us, instill some kind of uh, discipline uh, in, around work ethic. And I think our kids have definitely worked hard. Um, so those, that's my two cents. Um, I'm sure Usha has a lot more to say. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I agree with the only, um, uh, just to add a couple of thoughts, uh, before the kids were born, I think I was super scared about what might happen and what, how I could screw things up. Um, but I remember this person, um, who I respected who had older children who said, um, it, it was important to make sure the kids had something that they were good at on top of school before they were 11. And that seemed like good advice. Um, and one of the kind of motivations, um, for me at least, to support the kids in the musical um, interest, um, something that they could develop and nurture for the rest of their lives. So um, something that was a, a good goal to have um, before they were 11 to be uh, reasonably proficient at it. I'm so glad that they um, love it and continue it um, and have so for, for quite a long time. So it's been wonderful to see that. Uh, but as the kids became teenagers, uh, what I realized was something that was more important was um, being able to express their emotions and give words to their emotions, to their thoughts, having a conversation with themselves, um, because that was that that validated who they were and what their um, life trajectory would be and wherever they were to be able to express their emotions and find words and say, I feel this or I feel that, but, or, and, or because, and, and that's how they learn to communicate with other people and make, you know, the, their communities a better place. Um, to be perfectly honest, I don't know if I even do that um, even now as an adult, but I hope that as a parent, I, I've given them the opportunity um, to, to have that happen in their own lives. Thank you so much, Usha, for that insightful discussion. Um, moving on to another topic, uh, and actually I do want to thank you both, Uni and Usha, for sharing your parental experience, which is bound to inspire other parents. Moving on to another topic, zeroing in on zero. Uni, I hope you've had a chance to read the article I sent you on India's rich heritage from zero to infinity. Your strong background in mathematics and computer science must have helped you digest and further analyze the material presented in this article. Can you give us a synopsis of the part relating to the origin of zero and share your thoughts with us. Thank you. Yeah, I, Lily Auntie, I thoroughly enjoyed that article. I actually went through it quite a few times, uh, and it resonated with me on uh, multiple dimensions. Uh, so, um, first of all, uh, I come from a generation of, you know, math and science students who, uh, educated in the U.S., were not really exposed to the impact of, uh, uh, what our ancestors in India did in terms of like defining our field. You know, what really struck me was uh, how you, for example, in your article, how you cited Panini's uh, contributions to sort of uh, grammar uh, analysis. And, you know, I was taught in graduate school that Chomsky, as you had pointed out, you know, really invented mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these forms. But actually, as you also know, that Chomsky attributed credit to Panini. And, uh, you know, what a lot of people don't know is like, uh, Bacchus, I think also got credit for this. Bacchus was the inventor of Fortran, right? right. Um, and, uh, one of the key contributors at least, right? So the point being that we've grown up in this, uh, culture where, uh, you know, it, history has uh, about the contributions from our ancestors have largely been divorced, right? Uh, 
uh, uh, from uh, what's taught in sort of mainstream American, you know, engineering curriculum. So that was that was one level where it resonated with me. But the other level um, is just around the spiritual and philosophical aspect. So I don't claim to be a, a great you know, historian of mathematics, nor do I be, nor do I claim to be a religious scholar or anything, but, uh, intuitively, it makes a lot of sense that, you know, uh, our ancestors, you know, these ancient Hindus would have come up with the notion of zero, uh, because if you, if you kind of look at the arguments made in, uh, you know, Vedantic texts, all of those arguments are, are based around negation. Um, I remember reading like a text Viveka Chuda, the Viveka Chudamani by Adi Shankara in translation. And the whole first chapter is around negating, uh, the existence of all of these things that we perceive and you're left with nothingness. And the idea that this nothingness is something that you're looking at, right? Mm-hmm. Is very central to the idea of, uh, uh, this notion of creating a concept called zero. Uh, and so I think there's this underlying rich cultural kind of framework that informs uh, the article that you've written. So, so that was another thought uh, that hit me. Um, there were many others, like, you know, there's a book by Douglas Hofstadter called Godel Escherbach, which uh, he links, in which he links actually sort of the patterns he sees in Bach's music to ideas around computability that Godel had worked on. And I was thinking when I read your article, a similar case can be made. Uh, around sort of the beautiful linkages between Hindu philosophy, non-dualism, and, you know, the mathematics uh, that come from uh, from those same people who thought those ideas. Um, tying it back to what you asked earlier, uh, or what you're going to talk to Sahana and Kalyan about music, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's manifest in our, in our relative music systems, our Indian system versus Western, right? So in the Indian system, as Yehudi Menuhin, actually wrote, you know, it's a journey of the individual trying to find his self. And that journey of the individual is the same as the journey for sort of the collective group of people. And that's manifest in the music. Uh, so in Carnatic music or in Hindustani music, you have this notion of like a tonic and a perfect fifth. And, you know, it's a notion that was actually compromised in Western music so that you could have harmony. So the Western view of spirituality is an orderly heaven with, you know, many parts working together harmoniously. And when you listen to Bach, it's like a, you know, the idea is God is sort of this uh, big manufacturing engine with all of these gears working together versus the Hindu notion of the individual representing, you know, the community, right? And that's wow. reflected in the complexity of, of, of Western music around harmony uh, uh, versus the complexity of Indian music around microtones and and the journey of the individual. Yeah, yeah. we'll have I, a, I, a long discussion for another episode. But thank you so much, Uni, for zeroing in on zero and for your profound thoughts. I mean, linking music to zero and the whole works, uh, which I would never have thought about, frankly. So again, thank you. And my sincere thanks to the Narayanan family for a very inspiring session. Thank you. Thank you, Lily Auntie. To our listeners in America and around the globe, a big thank you for listening to the Global India Podcast. Hope you have enjoyed the podcast and have gotten a glimpse into how second and third generation Indian Americans are able to preserve their rich Indian heritage while getting fully assimilated in mainstream America. Indeed, it's heartening to see how they're able to get the best of both worlds. This is a free podcast. However, if you enjoy the podcast to the point where it puts you in a generous mood, you can unleash your generosity by donating to the Lions Club of Bangalore Whitefield. Please check out their website. Please write checks payable to Whitefield Lions Club Services Trust out of your Indian bank accounts and send them to Global India 7612. Fenwick Cove Lane, Orlando, Florida, 32819. For more details, please visit our website, www.globalindiapodcast.com. Please email your feedback and ideas for future episodes to globalindiapodcast at gmail.com. 
we would love to showcase your talents and accomplishments as well. All you have to do is to email us a note along with your bio data and a recording of your music. Alvida, adios, au revoir, and goodbye for now.